Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of roll some things together. We're talking about climate change. I'll address that a little bit. Uh, one of the focuses has been to try to get people to identify and recognize insect pests before they actually get a foothold. I usually think of it as, as a, way, a way to combat neighborhood fires. Some neighborhoods might hire the fire department to come and spray down the houses. They don't have any fires, and they say, see how well that works? Um, the other possibility is that you wait until the fire is totally burned out, then you bring in the fire department. What we want to do is prevent the fires, and that means you have to catch them right as they snow. Uh, I'm also going to talk about invasive species because it's become a, a serious and, and increasing problem. So they're defined as anything that's exotic, alien, non-native, you can see those words. The National Invasive Species Council definition is that it's non-native and alien to the ecosystem that it's in and it, that it's a species likely to cause economic damage. That means we pay for it. Or harm to human health and the environment. Not everything that, that gets here is going to be invasive. Not everything that gets here is going to create problems. But many do and uh, this definition also includes uh, genetically modified engineered organisms and increasingly is including viruses like West Nile virus or anthrax. Executive Order 1312, how many of you work for an agency that has federal ties? Oh, we can just skip this slide. <laughs> actually, federal agencies um, are actually directed to have an, uh, an invasive species plan and they may not, I'm just going to skip to the bottom, they may not authorize, fund, carry out any actions that cause or promote invasive species to be introduced or spread. That means that I work for WSU Extension. It has a federal tie. We are partly federal. And I cannot recommend an invasive species as a garden plant, even if I like it. A lot of these uh, organisms are quietly invading, and they, they're not just a biological organism. They're political, social, they affect habitats, uh, ecological and environmental uh, concerns. They're economic, they cost money. They create problems for health, for trade and uh, commerce, and even can have climate change considerations. I was reading a book called uh, Tox uh, Insectopedia, and the first chapter is air, and he goes on and on about all of the insects that are living in the air and have been since time began. They get picked up from updrafts. I don't know how they tell this, but they could tell that aphids are flying at 40,000 feet. Now, aphids are really tiny. <laughs> I just wonder how they do that. Um, but there's a lot of insects in the air. They've been picked up by updrafts. They float along for a while, and then they're dumped out in downdrafts. And so that has been happening, I would guess, since the world began. Native Americans brought um, foods with them and planted them and then moved on north. And when they came back, they would harvest those plants that were non-native uh, plants. Early explorers brought things from their homelands. Pioneers moving across the states brought their foods and their plants and their stored products and their crops, which included renegade seed. Animals uh, get things stuck to them and they get moved as the animals move. And then travelers are constantly bringing back that favorite thing from friends. So invasive species can also be moved by this whole list of things. Uh, household goods, vehicles, pallets, um, smuggled plants. I had a friend who said he got a willow in by calling it Asperinus deceptus. <laughs> and when the person said, that looks like a willow to me, he said, yeah, I thought so too, but there's the label. So people, I mean, even good gardeners and people who care about the world, they make, they make their things. If that had been a problem uh, plant, um, I'm sure that the state would have wanted to share the expense with him. Uh, other routes of entry include nursery stock, fairly traditional, uh, particularly coming in from England and New England and the, into the New England states in the early days, 1890s, and so on. It's gone on for years in plant sales, gardeners, pet trade, my goodness, the things people buy in, in pet stores. And then they decide they don't want them, so they just turn them loose. Um, anyway, lots of different ways in which these invasive species can get here. The general routes come, a lot of the stuff that we get here comes down from Canada. It's in British Columbia first, winter moth, 
um, European chafer, European crane fly, we can go on and on. Uh, a lot of the insects uh, and uh, things that moved in came in from the East Coast, uh, most often through New England. Uh, Florida gets more than its share of invasive species and uh, some are coming up through Texas, but it takes them a while to get to us. Uh, invasive species, the reason it's such an issue is uh, it's second only to habitat loss as the greatest threat to increasing global biodiversity, decreasing global biodiversity. And that includes both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Invasive weeds um, invade 1.7 million new acres of wildlife habitat each year. Invasive weeds cover over 4,500 new acres of public lands and waters each day. And currently aquatic invasive infests over 1 million acres which is twice the size of California. And I think it's important, you know, we think, oh, well, it's just a little wetland down there. But when you take it at the global scale, it becomes a major, major impact. Uh, globalization of trade and tourism uh, and these reductions of trade barriers has, has created problems in addition. Uh, ballast water uh, is a major transport mechanism for aquatic invasives. We've had 100 years of weed le legislation, but aquatic invasions are relatively new, and there aren't a lot of laws about that. And then you have the global movement of nursery and landscape products, uh, compost, landscape materials, coir, you name it, they can uh, bring in organisms with them. Global warming uh, insects uh, speed up their life cycle at higher temperatures. So global warming is going to have an impact, genetic engineering, the internet, and bioterrorism. Internet. People can buy anything on the internet, and they can buy illegal stuff and illegal pesticides and um, all kinds of organisms. So, more numbers. 4,000 plants and 2,300 2, animal species are already established in the U.S. It's assumed, and there's a 10% rule, it's just, and I'll talk about that in a minute too, but te, it's assumed 10% of the existing known species that are here um, have invasive potential, that's 26,000 potential problems. In San Francisco Bay, 230 uh, organisms are established, and a preliminary Puget Sound survey has established that there are 52 species. There's a 10% rule. 10% of everything that gets here uh, is, may become established. 10% of the introduced species can become established. 10% of those might spread and 10% of those will become invasive. That means they just really take over. Uh, they can displace native species. There's no, there's no native natural enemies to keep them in check. Although I read a paper that said that the, the uh, things arriving without natural enemies is not actually the cause for um, these, out, these outbreaks of invasive species. And I've noticed in a number of pests where they come, they flare up, and then they die down, and, and nobody really knows, because we're not studying to see whether, finally, our predators and parasitoids have figured out, whoa, here's dinner. And so um, it may be that some things are, are uh, controlled by natural forces here. Some of them outcompete natives for light and water and nutrients. They convert, convert local floral biodiversity into monotypic stands, and they disrupt food chains. Uh, they also have an impact on endangered species. They impact archaeological and historic sites, and they ch challenge that whole flexible, wonderful dynamic of the earth, which is biodiversity. And then there are economic impacts. Uh, the numbers are really quite astounding. Um, the uh, issues for ag are 71 billion per year, 170, 103, 137 billion annually, and these are old figures, so you know it's up by now. Um, and 177 billion with the things listed there. Um, and I mentioned that these things become political pests. They become economic pests, markets are lost, ports can't, you know, if you have a choice of buying, uh, uh, having a ship that comes out of Tacoma with no invasive species, 
nearby or a ship that's coming out of Seattle with an invasive species and you have the potential of importing something into your land, you're going to go with the port that has a, uh, doesn't have the threat. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that get involved. The other thing is that when a, when a shipment is, re, uh, is re rejected, the choice is to burn it, which means that nursery is lost. It didn't come from that shipment that it paid a lot for and, and, the, and the production of the plant, or they have to pay to ship it back so they can clean it up. So it becomes a horrid expense for the nursery. Uh, contamination of honeydew, uh, the gypsy moth is at the top right corner. Uh, these things have webbing that they, they travel with, and so it really mucks up the house. And the bottom picture is dogwood bore, which bores into wood uh, to pupate. I, I have a sort of a theory that you can just put soft wood under a infested tree and it'll bore in there, and then you can throw them in the fireplace. Uh, if it's your house siding, it's not quite so easy. Just an example of, of uh, insect development uh, can be influenced by climate. Uh, Roger Acre did a study to try to figure out why do we have these big um, yellow jacket outbreaks? What factors might be contributing to that? So he tried to correlate all kinds of different environmental factors. And what he found was that there was a high correlation between a very early warm spring when the queen could get out and start building her nests early. There was plenty of food available. They, the uh, life cycle was accelerated. The development time was accelerated. So the workers uh, emerged sooner. They could, then the queen could go into egg production and the workers could keep going. And um, it, it, it just, instead of uh, a queen starting off here, finally getting a nest going, she was back here. And then what would happen is you'd have a whole lot of yellow jackets and qu new queens going into the next season. So uh, climate can make a difference too. Um, mountain ash softfly is an insect that, uh, as near as I can tell, has two predictable generations. And sometimes it seems that it has a third generation. And if it has a third generation, then there's more going into the season. This is the softfly, these cute little guys here, uh, that started off with gangbusters and defoliation, and, and now it's hard to find them. There's even a book on climate change and insect pests. I thought, wow, I should order that. It's $130. Um, some insects require chilling, and if they don't have a winter chilling, they can't develop. So tent caterpillar, for example, if it um, is kept at a, a mild temperature, the little caterpillar is formed inside the egg right now, even as I'm speaking. And uh, if it's held at a mild winter temperature, those will not hatch. If, if they allow those eggs to be chilled to two degrees centigrade, those eggs will hatch. As a matter of fact, a uh, tech caterpillar will go to 29 below. Um, so the number of insects could be reduced if we had milder winters. But on the other hand, maybe not. Uh, some of the, the warming impacts are, and you've heard about uh, mountain pine beetle developing. Um, it creates a niche for other insects to move in because they were kept out by the cold, they don't, they don't die. Um, there's some uh, studies that have shown northward expansion or shifts of insect ranges, such as the mountain pine beetle. And as I mentioned, they can go through their life cycle much faster, they develop faster. This, I just came back from a pollination conference. Um, Dave Golson, who's a bumblebee expert, uh, was mentioning that the, uh, I can't remember the name of the bumblebee, but the lower line on this map is its original uh, distribution. And it's moving up and uh, not surviving. It's too hot for the bumblebee uh, now. So it's moving northward, but the, the, the top, distribution isn't moving northward, which they don't know about, they don't know why. But what it's doing is narrowing the range of area in which they have, um, in which they can live. And insects are being find at, found at higher elevations um, than, they, than they have been before, which means they're now in competition with the other things that lived at those elevations. And there's a thing called plant synchrony where synchrony where uh, the 
the uh, tent caterpillars, for instance, they come out, if they come out before bud break, then they come out, they don't have any food to eat. They're quite good at coming out about the time that the buds break, and so they're there uh, ready to go and they have food available to them. Pollinators, if, they, if the pollinator comes out too late and the flower that they rely on is already done, or if the flower that relies on the pollinator doesn't get the pollinator, then you have uh, disruptions in the normal biological systems. Okay, you folks, you the eyes in the field. There's two entomologists down at Washington State Department of Agriculture who put out traps, and they hire trappers every, uh, every summer to monitor those traps. But the chances of them, and, and the traps are intended to draw in uh, insects. But they have finite budgets. There's only a few insects that they can monitor for, and they have a finite number of people to do it. You folks, look at your look at the room here. You folks are out in the field. You are seeing the plants daily. I'm stuck at a desk half of the time, or I'm teaching, and uh, I don't get to play in the field as often. So you have huge potential for being early eyes in the field. You can spot the beginning of an infestation. If you get trained and you, you learn what's out there, you may spot tent caterpillar hatch instead of seeing caterpillars after they've defoliated the tree. I get calls from people who are upset because elm leaf beetle comes into the house. They didn't notice their trees had no leaves on them. I was like, really? Uh, but you can't. You can see when the first insects are starting to nibble. And so that makes it possible if we created a network where that information could be shared we could, we could intervene much sooner than after all the damage is done and the fire's gone out. around, then you're not gonna have an effect, uh, nearly the effectiveness. So um, we have a bunch of species that are already here. This, I'm gonna go through these slides very fast. These are pests of concern. If it's colored, it's colored uh, light color, it's a one that they're particularly worried about but so are all the black ones. And the ones that are red are, have arrived here. Most recently is the uh, brown marmory, the stink bug, and the viburnum leaf beetle. Viburnum leaf beetle I don't think is in King County yet, but it has reached central um, Snohomish County. So I'm just gonna go through very quickly. This is off the State Department of Agriculture's um, list of pests that have arrived and the years in which they arrived and which um, we might expect them. And we have a lot of pests that we fight regularly that were once invasive species. Most of the, the insects that we deal with chronically, like the root weevils and the elm leaf beetles and the oyster shell scales and pi white pine blister rust, those all were introduced species that became. The gypsy moth, uh, just as an example of how an invasive species can work. Um, the female can't fly, so her eggs build up in an area. Her eggs are the tan patch in the middle, and they can strip an entire forest. There was concern at the time of aerial spraying to prevent gypsy moth from getting here. Uh, there was concern that they would, um, uh, it would kill some moths, and in fact, the, the BT that was used did kill some moths. But when you see a forest that has no leaves, those moths were doomed to begin with. Uh, there's no cover for birds. There's no leaves for other insects that aren't moths uh, to eat. And they not only the foliage, but they go all the way down to the grass. These are the, the worst gypsy moth uh, infestation I know of was 13 million acres when I was keeping track of those things. The patch in the middle top is eggs. That's a lot of caterpillars. And I used to think that that woman was standing behind a screen until I realized that the caterpillars were behind her. I thought, wow, nobody wants that. So uh, we've lost nest size, cover, foliage, uh, exposure. Campers don't want to go there. You get a lot more water runoff and, and stormwater runoff, and you lose soil. In addition, there are health effects of an outbreak like that, where people get skin rashes from the hairs, and uh, as outbreaks continue, and they're horrendously costly. This is the cost from 1980 to 213, over 268 million dollars, and that's just for the Northeast. Here's insects that became pests. There's a couple of new ones in here. These are root weevils. I'm not going to go into detail. There's a new paper wasp, 
when it arrived in Colorado, the entomologists there were saying that their, their butterfly and, and moth population dropped substantially. Um, it competes for bird nest sites. Uh, it becomes numerous, it makes a lot of little nests. And we have it here now. You'll see, you know, a nest up in the eaves, another nest. Uh, I first saw it in my mom's uh, gas tank. I thought, well, that's going to be a surprise when she goes to put in gas. Um, and it changes a little bit with it. Normally we can live with paper wasps, but if these are, you know, nesting underneath the uh, picnic table and you have to just sit down without looking. Uh, fortunately, they're fairly docile. There are new wire worms that have screwed up the uh, cropping systems in the, in the Snohomish Valley that took out a whole cornfield at one point. Um, this is the uh, uh, mountain ash softline, a divine of Burnham leaf beetle. And you're going to see these this afternoon in my session. Um, you'll see the, uh, uh, I have four tables, we'll talk about that, but you'll see some of these invasive species. This thing uh, decimates uh, viburnums. There are some resistant ones that are in the list now. And uh, one of the things you can watch for are these little egg notches at the tips of branches. If you want to know if you've got it, just walk over to a viburnum now. It's, it's winter time, so they should, be, they should be present. And just look for these uh, little egg notches. I want to mention that some of these carry human diseases that are lethal. We don't have any snails or slugs that carry human diseases that are lethal right now. So if you find slugs and snails that you think, gee, this is kind of weird, I am more than happy to look at anything you want to bring in. First of all, I'm a collector of insecty things, so that's good. But more than that, we want to have a real early warning on these um, that may be carrying lethal, because once they get into water, that organism can contaminate the water and then contaminate other slugs and it kind of compounds. Isn't this just so cheerful? <laughs> I don't want you to. I don't want you to get gloom and doom. We're doing this from the standpoint of being pre proactive. So, uh, Eric Lagasa uh, has done some work with uh, tortricid moths. These are the ones that he's found. The color indicates whether they're new to North America, new to the U.S., or new to the West Coast. Uh, these are all things that uh, insects have a, a, a tendency to just kind of ride along for a long time and then they, they make a spike. They're kind of pretty, some of these. Japanese beetle has been detected several times and eradicated here. That's nice because they can um, both, they're a huge turf pest and then they also defoliate roses and wine and grapes and all kinds of things. Their life cycle is that they, the eggs are laid in July and the larvae spend the fall and winter in the soil and then the adults merge in the early summer and, and start feeding on foliage. Uh, particularly, they are, um, there might be beetles there in that other circle. Uh, there's an, another related organism called the European chafer. It was in British Columbia, the larvae feed on turf, and it was found in um, Federal Way this year, this spring. What it does is it devours all the roots and so you could actually walk and pick up the grass, just pick up, pick it up. But I think it, it, one of the challenges is that it looks a lot like crane fly damage. So you have to make a distinction between the crane fly in the lower right and the chafer on the lower, in the left. And if you find chafer, please report it because we're trying to we're trying to get ahead of these things. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, I'm sure you've heard of. They attack healthy maples. They have certain hardwood trees that they really love. They are a wonderful big beetle. Unfortunately, I only had one, so I only can have one table with this. So if you find some, get me some beetles. Uh, but more importantly, it needs to be reported. This insect, the cost of replacing just city trees killed by uh, Asian longhorn beetle is estimated at 669 million over a 30 year period. But they haven't been here 30 years, that's projecting. It's a, it's a large beetle and it has very nice long striking um, antenna that are, have white on it. We have native beetles that look a little like this. So um, bring the beetles in, we'll get them identified. There are a couple of comparative things on the web. Um, Emerald ash borer is another one we're watching for. 
And so there's an adult, they're actually quite small. I think they're less than a half an inch. Spring. They lay eggs and uh, they can fly. They fly quite readily. These are the hosts uh, that are listed there. Um, Asiatic lilies and oriental lilies. Some of the oriental are resistant. Solomon seal, uh, nightshade, smilax, the cochiana. Not day lilies, they're not a true lily. The concern is they're gonna be a huge problem for cut flower growers, bulb growers, Hmong cut flower growers, hobbyists and display gardens, and native plants. So we wanna get ahead of that one too. Brown marmorated stink bug was found in Everett last year and has been found in Bothell this year. Um, it's distinctive. I'll have an insect, I'll have some for you to look at. We have a lot of native stink bugs. The thing that's distinctive about the brown marmorated stink bug is that it has, uh, not sure why those disappeared, but it has um, a little band on the antenna and it has um, a smooth shoulder. Right here is a smooth shoulder on a brown marmorated stink bug. You can, you can kind of see it there that it's smooth. Our native species have little teeth. Now, it occurs to me that some of you are sitting there thinking, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so bring them in, we'll get them identified for you. You don't have to learn that. And in talking with Robin Rosetta, who also went to the pollinator conference, there are three white, new white fly species in Oregon that are creating great clouds of white flies and stirring some media attention. And so identifying these, I don't know if you notice in the upper left, that white fly isn't just pooping out uh, honeydew out of its back end, it's pooping it, it's, it's honeydew is exuding all around it. So, and new to the uh, list of things that we can watch for is, I can't remember, I think it's Pennsylvania, that the spotted lantern fly has been uh, found. It has a huge host range, it attacks a variety of plants. 65 species are known in Korea. Willow, maple, aspen, and tulip poplar are favorites. Um, their costs are huge. There's a potential of 12 billion in hardwood and pine, so that strikes me that it means they also get on pines. So this is the uh, lanternfly egg mass compared to a gypsy moth egg mass. Um, so if you find things like this, snap a photo and send it to me. I'm happy to look at it. So you're the eyes in the field. And uh, there's some studies that should, the, the state has looked at who has reported the first report of insects. 30% of those came from uh, trapping efforts of the Department of Ag. 30% came from master gardeners and gardening public. And 30%, I don't remember where they came from. I think it may have been landscape professionals. So you are an important, uh, an important observer and you can detect these things and we could maybe get out in front of them. And it really is gonna take that because there's no political will to do eradication. We're gonna be living with these things for a long time unless we get ahead of them.